In the words of Taylor Swift, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling 1982, 83. And never mind, we're not going there. That's that's not <laughs> that's not the words to the song. Anyway, in this commemoration, the 40th anniversary of the 1983 national championship, the survive and advance team, this NC State team comes out here and handles business. As the kids say today, they stand on business, and that's what they did again. After one sweep of an in-state rival over the weekend, they come in and say, we're not done yet. Bring more brooms out. We have got to talk the 90-74 victory that NC State comes away with in the PNC. Grayson, does that sound like a good episode to you? What a night. It was a near-perfect night. Absolutely. And we're going to bring you a near-perfect or or a perfect, who knows, show today talking about the Wolfpack. You are Locked On Wolfpack, your daily podcast on the NC State Wolfpack, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Oh, don't mind me, Grayson. Don't mind me. Just breaking out my commemorative broom. Just breaking Doing out a little, my... little housekeeping over there. Just, just breaking out my broom. I got to be like my boys. They breaking out the broom tonight. I'm breaking out my broom tonight because they swept Wake Forest. In impressive fashion, might I add, this game was back and forth early. Wake Forest was hot as fish grease from deep. Appleby could not miss. I believe he started, what, four or five from the field? I know he hit, his, he hit his first three in a row. Yeah, started off three or four from deep. So he hit his first three. And I'm not going to lie to you. Those were not shots that I look at and I'm like, yeah, he'll hit that every day and twice on Sunday. It was like, mm, he's hot right now, but I'm not going to lie to you. Grayson text. I texted Grayson during the game. They did not listen to our keys. They're hot from deep. And Grayson said, they will not shoot like this all night. And boy, was he right. Tell me, what are your takeaways from this game? I tell you what, uh, you know, our our – our pregame breakdown was about dead on. Uh, you know, the first half, Wake came out. They were shooting the leather off the basketball. And like I said, they looked like a team that was coming in desperate for a win. They looked like they were fired up to be there. They, Like I said, I mean, I believe it was after, after the first eight or ten minutes, they were still shooting like 91%, which is a ridiculous sentence to say out loud. But it was factual. Absolutely. They were shooting that well. And, and that's, I think that's around the time that you texted me and, you know, every time they're, they're hitting another bucket, I was like, mm, okay, well, they're surely they won't hit the next one splash. No way they do it three times in a row splash. I was like, okay, what's going on here? But the key part of that is we were sticking right with them. We were playing just as well, if not probably even a little bit better, but they were just hitting threes instead of us feeding the ball to DJ. Um, very funny yeah. that they still had no answer for DJ Burns. Absolutely, they, you did see him get double teamed a bit more, like, like we predicted. But I thought, outside of one turnover, kind of late in the second half, DJ handled that very well. Um, I thought he passed when he needed to pass, and when he felt like he could take it to the bucket, he did, and he was very successful in doing so. He finished with 21 points. Uh, I believe it was on like eight of 11 field goals. So I don't, I can't do the math off my head, but. That's a very high percentage of uh, baskets being made there. So I mean, just um, just a hair under eighty percent, literally. There you just, go. Just eighty percent. You'll live with that every day. I think. Uh, I think I I missed my uh, my score prediction very narrowly. I think I said eighty eight seventy eight. It was ninety seventy four. So it the game went about like I predicted it to. Um, did I think Wake was Wake was going to shoot that well in the beginning? No, but I wasn't surprised to see how active they were in trying to kind of shock us shell shock us on a night that was very special uh to us but credit to wake i mean they came out and played well they couldn't keep it up the uh, you know the rest of the way because i think we we turned up the defense a little bit and uh we got it done tonight but you know like i like i mentioned to, to start off the show here it was a near perfect night it was the exact kind of win that you wanted to see out of our team knowing what wake needed to come in and do we took care of business we honored our 1983 team. Uh, you know, like I mentioned in the show yesterday, Sydney Lowe, I think, got the warmest reception, which I, I love to see that. Um, we had the, the throwback uniforms on. 
which I think need to be permanent moving forward. We should also get the red away version, but uh, we can talk about that another time. It was a near perfect night. We played excellent. We are undoubtedly at this point an NCAA tournament team. I don't think, I don't think we need to win the next two games. I want to win them. I don't think we need to win the next two games to get into the tournament. I think tonight is a firm stamp. We are going to the dance. I I look at this game and like you said, near perfect. Jack Clark goes down and that's the thing, know, yeah. Ends up in the sling. And and when Jack Clark was hitting threes early in the game, I'm like, oh, it's our night. We're going we're gonna work this thing out. I don't know what they did to Jack Clark. The script writers, whoever is writing the scripts for NCAA basketball, thank they did you. did my boy dirty tonight. Thank you for writing in Jack Clark to hit some threes, but please, please put him back on the court. All right. Uh, but with that being said, you know, uh, another thing that I'm looking at, and I hate to be the Debbie Downer that's raining on parades here. I hope that Monsanto is all right as well. Um, you know, we we don't at, here at Locked On Wolfpack, we're never the the type of guys to celebrate um, another team's misfortune in terms of health and injuries. That's just not who we are. So um, we're we're truly hoping that whatever is wrong with him is temporary, and if it is a, a long term thing, he has the speediest recovery possible. Same to Jack Clark. But now. The last thing that I'll say to rain on the parade a little bit that, you know, not injury related, Terquavian Smith still seems to be on that snide a little bit. He still seems to be in that in that mode a little bit. But it kind of gives me uh, hope because we're winning without him playing well. And remember, last year, that was impossible. That was NC State, win a basketball game where Tequavin does score 30 challenge. Difficulty level, impossible. And yet this year, it's like he's struggling and we're just rolling right along. It's, hey, it's all right. We're struggling. It's, he's struggling. We as a team are going to keep it moving. And again, I got a feeling that, again, that volcano, when it erupts, when it, it there's there's too much pressure built up. There's too much, too many bad games back to back. And when he gets that hot hand again, Oh man! Oh, yeah, you man. you you kind of beat me to the punch here because that was kind of the main, I guess, negative part of the game I wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think you've made the reference before where you know Baby T has the green light and it should maybe be a yellow light. Right. I think it should now be a yellow light with a speed camera on it as well, just in case he gets a little too excited and uh, racks up a speeding ticket. I'm just I'm not seeing it right now from Traquavion Smith. He's just extremely inefficient it feels like every game now um you know we know the kind of player he can be but the best basketball i saw tonight was with him off the floor to be very honest you know yeah. jarkel was more than comfortable running the offense tonight he's on an absolute tear right now so Absolutely. thank goodness for him stepping up because of you know Chiquavion's struggles here but i don't it's just not it's just not working the ball's just not going in the bucket and the the most influential minutes we're getting from Traquavion is when he's distributing the ball rather than seeking buckets. I mean, he still finished with 13 because he's talented enough to still put the ball in the bucket. It's just the the volume at which he's shooting at, and it's just so inefficient because he's not he's just not converting. So, I mean, he's Can gonna be fine moving forward. He's such a talent that we're not gonna have to worry about him falling apart here, but our best basketball is not necessarily with him having to lead the charge here. We're having a multitude of other players picking up the slack and we look like an awesome basketball team regardless. And can I, can I talk about one more thing? Cause you talked about DJ Burns efficiency and I'm going to talk yeah. about the positive now. Cause I started off Debbie Downer cause I'm a, I'm gonna give you the good stuff now. You know what I mean? I'm sour patch kid on you. I'm sour and I'm sweet. Now let me tell you, I'm looking at DJ Burns' stat line. And do you know what sticks out to me the most? Personal fouls, zero, zero. DJ Burns, that is not only a reflection of DJ Burns, it's a reflection of our perimeter defense. A lot of the fouls that DJ Burns picks up, especially the ones that have me pulling out hair that I don't have here, it, are the ones where our guards get beat and then he swipes at the ball or something along those lines, like, you know, attempting to get a steal in a, in a position where it doesn't really make sense for him to do so. His discernment to not have those moments as well as better perimeter defense to kind of not make it to where a good big cleans up all your messes defensively, right? 
like a, a good big defensively is like the nanny. Anytime somebody drops something, spills something, the big shows up. Hey, friend, I got you. Don't worry. He's not going to get in scot-free. And so uh, for him to not have to do that as much tonight against a very talented group of guards, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll rock with that um, every day of the week and twice on Sunday. So this this was a very good showing by him. Very uh, a very intelligent defensive night from him. A very a night defensively where you see him showing, hey, I have the ability to play smart, to not get in foul trouble, to not have those moments where you know you just are looking up like, man, what is he doing? What is going on here? That's what you absolutely love to see out of DJ Burns. So, you know, this game, much more good than bad. Much more good than bad. And uh, we're going to chat about what we got in terms of the the beauty of the 83 team coming back and, and what we have going forward in just a second. But before we do, I've got to talk to you all about FanDuel. Folks, it's America's number one sports book for a reason. The midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel. It's America's number one sports book because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if you if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. And then you can bet on everything from the spreads to the money line, the point scores, to threes drained, to block shots, all of it. You can bet it all at FanDuel. Plus FanDuel lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss out on your chance for a no sweat first bet of up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. So, Grayson, I'm going to tell you this. On uh, Locked on ACC uh, last night, I did a live episode with Candace Cooper where she says, you know, the boys in baby blue won their game. They're they're You know, they came away with a tight win in, in um, South Bend and, and that's, you know, they survived in advance. And I said, not, not on the 40th anniversary, not on the 40th. Don't disrespect us like that. It, it was such a beautiful thing to see that team back. And I'm going to just tell you this, you know, the question came up of, um, is this team a one-off or do you see this as the potential start of a little bit of a realignment in the triangle? Is this a situation where you're looking at it and you're saying, hey, NC State can be the big kids on the block. We can be the bullies of the block against historical powers like Duke and UNC. What do you think? I as as it stands right now, I wouldn't go so far as to say like the beginning of a realignment, but I think it's the beginnings of kind of what we've been waiting for uh, in Keats's tenure. We've been waiting for a very successful regular season where we're winning the games we're supposed to win. We're even shocking some folks, you know, beating a Miami or earlier in the season. We thought Duke was better than they were and we beat them at home and that was great. We're getting the high-level recruits on the horizon here. We're we're going to the tournament. I've, I'm 100% comfortable now saying that. We're going to the tournament. It's, and I mean, not to not to peek over the fence to see what color grass theirs, their, theirs is, but the two blue schools are having, I guess, down years by their standards. So to enjoy the success is great. We still have a lot of work to do if we want to, if, if we want to realign the triangle, but it seems like we're starting to get that tangible progress. Now, you know, moving forward, is it a little bit of a one-off? Maybe. Like, for example, there will not be a Jarkel next year. We don't know about Baby T. I would imagine he's probably moving on. We don't know yet. Mahorchich, don't know yet. He, he could get a miracle medical redshirt. Don't know yet. Um, you know, Burns, he can come back. Don't know yet. Just there's so there's still kind of uncertainty on how how many pieces we're going to be able to keep from this season, but I'm ex- I mean it goes without saying ex- over the moon with the turnout for this season so far. We've doubled our win total last year from our worst season ever. We're going to the tournament. A lot to be excited about moving forward. Well, there's a lot of work to do, so I don't want to say we're realigning nothing yet, but 
if we keep our head down and work at it, we it could be the beginning of that. You don't want to say it, but I will. <laughs> do you watch? Do you watch uh, Avatar, Grayson? Yeah. Do you remember what it was called when the Fire Nation had their powers enhanced by a, a certain thing that flew by? Do you remember what it was called? Sozin's Comet, wasn't it? Sozin's Comet. And folks, Coach K and Roy Williams retiring at the same time. Sozin's flying this comet. Now, now, if you know how that worked out for the Fire Nation in Avatar, like, it didn't work out the way they thought it would. But with that being said, obviously, we're not trying to do anything terrible in genocide. So, yeah, it should work out for Keats. It should work out for Keats. The plan and the goal here is to just be the dominant force, which, I mean, the Fire Nation kind of already was beforehand. Enough of Avatar lore. The point is this. This is a moment that's primed for realignment. And again, I'm a firm, firm, firm believer. And it's not about your X's and your O's, it's your Larry's and your Joe's. And realistically, if you ask me, is Coach Keats top five, 10 in the conference, or top five, top half of the conference in terms of X's and O's, I'd probably say no. I'd probably say no. I would agree. But if you ask, is he top five in getting the Larry's and the Joe's? Mm. We can get it done in the family room. And I'm going to ask you this. And, and, and this, obviously, we're a little biased because, you know, I play for NC State. You play for NC State. We are guys who graduated from NC State, you know. And, yes, club sports counts. Ask Ice Pack. Club sports counts, y'all. So, like I said, Grayson played for NC State, too. With <laughs> that being it. said, with that being said, um. Candace Cooper, who was a swimmer at UNC, and I were discussing the Coach Keats and his potential impact. And she, the question that I posed to her when she said, "Are you? Do you think that this is a realignment or that NC State can possibly take over as the power in the conference?" I said, "This. It's not about your X's and your O's. It's your Larrys and your Joes. And who do you think the best at getting the Larrys and Joes based on who they are, not on the brand?" Based on who they are, you could drop them off at uh, Middle America Delta Valley State University Community College, and they'd figure out a way to get some ball players. That you're like, wait, how did they end up there? I'm gonna tell you this: it ain't Hubie and it ain't Shire. Those two started life on third base, and yeah. they got and 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 Hubie getting to the final. Everybody said it was a home run. Well, it's easy to get home when you start on third base. Coach Keats started with sanctions against him. He started with a, a bought Dennis Smith team that didn't even win in that didn't even win significantly enough to get to a tournament. He started with 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 postseason bans looming over this team's head. That's how he started. Some people would say he started with two strikes at home plate. He didn't even start at just zero. He started behind the eight ball, a 0-2 count. Yeah, I've been studying up on my baseball. You know what I mean? I've been trying to impress Grayson here. All right. But anyway, all right. he started with an 0-2 count, and he figured it out. He's he's getting there. So I will say this. I am not a 1,000% certain that this is a realignment. I hope it is. I hope it's the start. I hope it's the, this is the year that people look back at and say, like, wait, when did NC State start dominating the conference? I think it was, uh, what was it, 2020? It was the Jarkel Joyner year and DJ Byrne. Yeah. I hope that this is one of those situations. So we'll we'll see. Um, I hope it's that. But, man, it's feeling like 83. Feeling like 83, baby. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors to land this thing. And we're back. So in looking at what we have going for the rest of this season, right, and looking at what we have in terms of, you know, potentially getting the box, like you said, we are right outside knocking on the door, knocking on the door. We're a half game back of Clemson, and guess who we play next? Those Clemson Tigers. The team that Dabo Sweeney said is made with NIL, made in God's name image and likeness. What a great time. I'm glad that the basketball team isn't like that too. How hilarious. Anyway, <clears throat> we're sitting here looking at a, a situation where NC State could move into that double by by winning Saturday. I'm excited. I'm thrilled. 
I'm I'm geeked up about this game. What say you? Yeah, so I, I kind of hinted at this yesterday, but now we can kind of get more in-depth to it. It's right in front of us. The, the four seed is right in front of us. We have Clemson on Saturday, and then our next game is at, uh, at Duke. Duke is only a half game behind us, so they could potentially get in if we kind of fumble our uh, our footing here, but it's it's wide open. I mean, UVA got blown out by Boston College. What in the world is going on there? So Miami, uh, subsequently, trampoline back into first place. Uh, so I'll pull it up right now. As it sits, oh, Miami yeah. one, yep. hit two, UVA three, Clemson is four. Those four teams are separated by a game and a half. Mm-hmm. And everybody's got two or three games left. It's wide open. So NC State is in a great position to get, I said sneak, uh, a couple times in previous episodes, I don't even think it's sneak now. We're about to bust our way through that door. I'll tell so, you what: if you beat the team that's fourth, you ain't tiptoeing through the window. You're you're not tiptoeing through the window to say, "Hey, Mrs. Johnson, it's me." You're coming in, knocking on the front door. Hey, Clemson, get out! This ain't your house no more. We belong here. So yeah. So I mean, we beat Clemson on Saturday. We trampoline up into the four spot, and then we got Duke right after that. Now. You also got to factor in the uh, the games that other teams still have to play. So, for example, Clemson, they play us on Saturday. Then they have to go to UVA. So UVA could do us a huge solid because if Clemson loses back-to-back, they're gone. They're out of there. So then, I mean, you got to factor in not so much Virginia because they're kind of higher up, but Virginia still has uh, – they got to play UNC. They got to play Clemson, and they got to play Louisville. So they're, uh, they're probably going to win all three of those. Pitt, they play Syracuse at Notre Dame and then Miami. Oh, this is what I want to talk about. Very cool that it's going to shape out that the one and two have to play each other for whoever gets one and two to end the regular season. Obviously, that's not by design. It's shaped out that way, but that's very cool. That's going to be primetime television uh, that last game. But to, to summarize here, it's right in front of us if we want to take it. I hope we decide to take it because a double bye. I mean, people have been kind of talking about the way the NC State uh, are the final weekend of the regular season. We don't have a game. We have a bye. So uh, a singular bye there and then getting the double bye, it almost turns into a triple bye, which people kind of get worried about because that's like two and a half weeks of not playing basketball. But right. I think in this instance, you have uh, a Jack Clark like tonight gets injured. We hope it's not going to be too bad, but – if he needs a little bit extra time to come back healthy, that could be crucial going mm-hmm. into the ACC tournament. And I mean, same thing with Mahorchich. We don't know if we're even going to get him back, but that little bit extra time that we could buy to get some players back could make a humongous difference that we could even make a deep run in the ACC tournament itself. So very excited to see how this shakes out. It's people talk about how down the ACC is this year. I don't buy that. I think Miami's very solid. I think UVA, despite, kind of falling all over themselves tonight. I think they're very solid. We're very solid. Pittsburgh's very solid. I don't I don't think I mean Again, you you and I both know why people say the ACC is down. Of course. But, the the yeah. net ratings and that UNC is bad and Duke is bad. That's what it is. That's what it is. I mean, but again, the net ratings, NC State's net rating went down from winning a game. Like that's stupid. It's that's a stupid reality. metric. Uh, and beyond that, again, I don't ever believe that a conference should be tied to a team or teams up. I'm never that guy. I'm a Detroit Lions fan, so I hate hearing it's good for the league when this team is good because it's always used in reference to the Green Bay Packers. I hate the fact that Locked On gave us yellow and green shirts as like part of our deal here. I wish that they would pick a different company color. Maybe Honolulu, Honolulu blue and silver. Who knows? But anyway... The fact of the matter remains simple. It is not good for the ACC, just for the traditional powers to be good. It is good to see a lot of different teams be good. Absolutely. You would rather rather have a conference with six, seven, eight teams that are potentially going to the tournament than just have one or two traditional powers be going to the tournament. So, again, with all the mess that people talk about our net, we're still sending five teams if, if the tournament started today. According to Joe Lenardi and company, if the tournament started today, 
we'd send five teams as many as the fourth best conference. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Thank you all so very much for coming out tonight, Wolfpack. Wolfpack Nation. You came out to the game for a 9 p.m. game. Grayson, I heard the atmosphere was electric. In there. I was in the building. It was. Uh, I was very pleased. I thought it was about as good as it gets for a 9 p.m. midweek tip. So I thought the crowd brought it. It looked like the players were feeding off of it. And like I said, it was it was essentially a perfect night. So it was Absolutely. great. Absolutely. Absolutely. So with that being said, Wolfpack Nation, again, y'all make this thing possible too. You all showing up, supporting, showing love, you make it possible. If you saw how that second half ended, it did not end in the way that it did because, uh, because Monsanto went down. Yes, that probably contributed, but also it was the fact that y'all were so loud. Every shot that was hit in that second half, we were only up seven, eight points at times, and yet those shots in the beginning and middle of the second half felt like dagger, 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 dagger. And it was just like the 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 crowd was erupting and, and I was listening to the radio broadcast. Thanks a lot, Bally Sports. We love you oh so much, Bally Sports. We hope that you don't go bankrupt. I'm lying. That's like, that's like part of the reason I decided to go to the game tonight is because it was on Bally. I was like, well, if I can't watch it at home, then I might as well just go. So I'd rather pay for a ticket than pay Bally Sports a dime of my yep. money. Every day and eight times on Sunday. So, with that being said, Wolfpack Nation, thank y'all so very much for showing up and showing out for this team. Thank y'all for showing up and showing out for this game. Keep it rolling. Make it loud. Make it ruckus. Guess what? The tip-off ain't 9 p.m. Saturday, if I'm correct. Am I? And and, and even if it was a 9 p.m. tip, where you got to be on Sunday morning? You got to be. You know what I mean? I mean, hey, I'm just saying. I, I know that. If most churches don't get rolling until 10 a.m. I'm just saying, you know what I mean? Uh, whatever you worship, whatever deity you worship or believe in, most most of them on Sunday mornings, you all right at 9 a.m., you all right? I'm just saying. So make sure y'all go support the pack this Saturday as we go and buy for that double buy. Peace and love, y'all. And as always, go pack. Go pack. You are Locked On Wolfpack, your daily podcast on the NC State Wolfpack, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. 